great to see you and thank you for joining me and my channel Brutus on Baseball. This video is going to be a continuation of a short series that I've put together all about the use of statistics in baseball. In previous videos I covered pitching and batting stats. Today's video is going to be all about defensive stats. I described in previous videos about the difference between traditional stats and advanced stats or metrics, and I told you in previous videos that I was going to separate the two. I was going to talk mostly about traditional stats and save advanced analytics for another time. Well, in today's video, I'm going to merge them together just a little bit. And that's simply because there aren't a lot of traditional defensive stats that are that useful, especially with respect to how we understood the game. And the use of advanced metrics and the details that go into them have really been able to greatly enhance our understanding of the defensive side of the game of baseball. Now, defensive stats are both traditionally very simple, but also open to a lot of interpretation. Let's start with the basics. The simplest defensive stat is innings. This is simply the number of innings that a player has played on the field. He gets one inning for every three outs that are recorded. And so if he doesn't play a full inning, he might get a third or two thirds of an inning, just like in my pitching stats video. But every game that he plays, he racks up the innings. And if he plays a full nine inning game, he gets nine innings for that game. The purpose of this stat is to track how much baseball that player played. In traditional thinking, the more innings that a player racks up, it means the more he stuck around with teams that wanted to put him on the field, meaning he must have been a pretty good player, at least on defense. Now, innings does keep track of how much time a player spends on the field, but it doesn't really tell anything about what the player did. It doesn't tell what position he played and whether that position was involved with a lot of plays or not, or if he was even any good at playing his position. So the next stat that I'll talk about is chances. And chances is simple again. It's just how many chances did that player have to field a ball that was hit into his general area. An important distinction here is that a chance is only counted when a ball is hit to that player's area and he has a reasonably good chance of fielding it. Now this can be interesting because if the same ball is hit to two different fielders, one of them may actually be able to reach that ball while the other doesn't. Player A here, Ozzie Smith, is able to reach a ball that maybe because he's faster or has better reaction time, whereas player B may not be able to reach that ball. Maybe he's a little bit slower on his feet. But a chance is only given to player A because he actually has a chance to field the ball. Player B isn't given a chance because he didn't really get close enough to reasonably field the ball. This is where I mentioned that judgment comes into defensive stats a lot, and that judgment is by the person keeping the official score of the game. The official score is a person that sits way up in the press box to watch the whole game and keep track of what happens. They don't make any decisions on the field out safe, that's the umpire's job, but it's the official scorer's job to watch the play and then to decide how to categorize it after the play is over whether it should have been a hit or an error, whether a fielder should be given a chance or not. Now, if a play is given a chance, then it's divided up into one of three buckets. The first of those buckets is the put out. And a put out results when a player is actually responsible for making an out on another player. For instance, primary examples are a catcher catching a third strike or an outfielder catching a fly ball, a first baseman catching a throw to beat a runner or an infielder tagging a runner out. Essentially, for every out in a game, there should be a put out credited to one of the fielders that was responsible for making that out. The next way that a chance can be categorized is an assist. This is when a player touches the ball at some point during a play, but isn't directly responsible for getting that out. Most commonly, this is when a player fields a ground ball and makes a throw to the first baseman. The first baseman is the one that has his foot on first base and receives the ball to get the out, but the fielder that actually picked up the ground ball and threw it is given an assist. In some cases, an assist can actually be given to a player that's hit by the ball, doesn't actually make part of the play, but because he was a part of the action, he's given the assist that eventually has resulted in an out. Both the pitcher and the fielder that picked up the ball get an assist while the first baseman gets the put out. Another example is a double play. This is where maybe a shortstop fields a ground ball, throws to the second baseman to get the first out, and then onto the first baseman for the second out. In this example, the shortstop gets an assist, the second baseman gets a put out and an assist for the second out, and the first baseman also gets a put out for the second out. The third bucket for categorizing a chance is an error. An error happens when a player should have been able to make a play, but for one reason or another, he could not execute it. This can be from dropped fly balls or ground balls that are bobbled or throws that are way offline or maybe even a catcher that didn't catch the third strike. 
It's important to note that errors are only counted on plays that the official scorer determines should have been a play that the average player could make. Because of this interpretation, a very difficult play that's not able to be converted into an out would not be counted as an error, and therefore also wouldn't be counted as a chance. In the end, we have a simple formula. Errors plus assists plus putouts equals chances. Using these stats, we have a simple formula that can calculate what's called fielding percentage which essentially answers the question, out of how many chances a player has, how often they will convert that into a putout or an assist. The formula is simple. Putouts plus assists divided by chances, which is putouts plus assists plus errors. Fielding percentages have historically been well above 900, with the highest percentages in history ranging somewhere in between 980 to 990, meaning that the best players in the game will convert 98 or 99 plays out of every 100 chances that are hit to them. But fielding percentage alone is not a very good stat. It can be very misleading, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the positions on the field that actually have historically had the best fielding percentages are the first basemen and outfielders, positions that are easier to play. And because of this, teams usually put the players that can't play defense as well at these positions, but they result in the highest fielding percentages. Shortstops and third basemen have historically had the worst fielding percentages in the league, even though this is where usually our best defensive players are put. And that's because they have the most difficult plays to make or the most difficult throws to make. Now, second of all, it also doesn't take into account how good a player actually is on defense. Because defense isn't just about whether they can convert a play that's hit right to them or catch a ball that's hit right to them. Defense is also about whether a player can reach a ball that's hit near them. If you think about it, if a player is better on defense, he should be able to reach a ball that's hit further away that another player may not be able to get to. But as a result, a superior defensive player may actually have a worse fielding percentage than his peers because he's able to reach balls that are more difficult. And as a result, he has a harder time making those plays or making those throws. Fielding percentage penalizes that player, even though he's actually able to convert more outs because he's able to reach more balls that are hit on the field. This is where our discussion of advanced analytics comes in, because without them, we just can't really tell the full story about defensive stats. Traditional stats aren't enough to tell us the quality of a player especially when comparing players in different seasons and different eras. A great recent example that's brought up often is the Hall of Fame candidacy of Omar Vizquel versus a well-established Hall of Famer in Ozzie Smith. Now, Vizquel's recent off-field troubles aside, in recent years, a common argument for Vizquel to be included in the Hall of Fame is that a lot of people see Vizquel as the 1990s equivalent of the wizard, Ozzie Smith from the 1980s. He's called the wizard because of all the defensive plays he could make on a regular basis that no one else could, and he's often considered the best defensive shortstop in the history of the game. If you look at fielding percentage only, you might actually think that with Vizquel's fielding percentage of 985, compared to the wizard's career percentage of 978, that Vizquel's case for the Hall of Fame actually stands up. But if you take the time to dig into other traditional stats, you may change your mind. For example, innings, Vizquel has 24,519 to the Wizards' 21,785. So Vizquel did play the same position of shortstop almost two full seasons longer than the Wizard did. But even though he played longer, his number of chances are fewer at 12,508 compared to the Wizards at 12,905. This means that even though Vizquel played two full seasons longer than the Wizard, at the same position, he had less chances to field the ball than the Wizard did, meaning he couldn't get to a lot of the same balls that the Wizard could. And here's where we introduce our first defensive metric, range factor. Range factor is defined by a very simple equation, which is putouts plus assists divided by innings. We usually express this stat as range factor per nine innings. Simply put, how many balls can a player reach per nine inning game without errors included? Using this stat, we can see that Vizquel had a range factor per nine innings of 4.52, while the Wizard had a range factor per nine innings of 5.22 which demonstrates the Wizards' clear superiority. Now, I'm not here to say that Vizquel was not a good defensive player. He was good. He's just not anywhere on the same plane as Ozzie Smith. His range factor per nine innings of 4.52 is way better than some other shortstops that for some reason were considered to be much better than they actually were. 
And so advanced defensive metrics are introduced because they show us how good a player is, not only at fielding balls that are hit right to them, but how good they are at reaching balls that other players just can't get to. There are several different types of advanced defensive metrics, such as defensive runs saved, defensive wins above replacement, and fielding runs above average, just to name a couple. The difference between these isn't really important for this video, so I'm not going to get into comparisons of how the different stats are measured or the merits of one over the other. The main point is that each of them try to take into account the player's range, meaning how far they can travel to reach a ball that perhaps the average player can't. You can think of this as the field being divided into a chart based on where balls are hit, and each small area is assigned a number based on the percentage of times that a successful play to get an out is made and a ball that's hit into that area. If player A also makes that play, his defensive stats improve. If a player can't make the play, his defensive stats decrease. All of this is based on a complex formula that takes into account how often the play is made by other players in the league, and it's normalized to the league average. Some of these stats also take into account how strong a fielder's arm strength is at throwing the ball, and how that can help to prevent runners from advancing an additional base compared to other players that have weaker arms. And going back and watching video of Vizquel and the Wizard to evaluate them in terms of advanced defensive metrics paints an even clearer picture. Using fielding runs above average, which boils a number down to whether a defender saves more runs than the average player, which is anything above zero, or allows more runs than the average player, anything below zero, shows that Vizquel saved about 129 runs above average over the course of his career, which by the way, remember, was two seasons longer. However, the Wizard saved 200. 39 runs above average, which is the highest mark in the history of the game. So going back to fielding percentage, we can see that Vizquel was actually ahead of the Wizard in this department over the course of their careers. It only took into account hits that Vizquel could reach, considering his range. And all it could possibly tell us is that Vizquel could potentially handle those balls better than the Wizard, the balls that are hit easier that he could actually manage. But advanced defensive metrics tells us that even though the Wizard had a lower fielding percentage and more errors than Vizquel, he was just way more valuable defensively than Vizquel ever was to his team, simply because he could track down a lot more hits, resulting in a lot more outs, and therefore a lot fewer runners on base, which results in a lot fewer runs being scored, and ultimately, fewer runs means more wins and more value to his team. And not wanting to bash Vizquel too much, we can think about this in terms of any player on the field. Some outfielders that are really slick and quick to reach balls that nobody else could get to, as opposed to other outfielders that could have a lot more of a difficult time running around in the grass out there. The advanced defensive metrics helps us to quantify all of this information and make it a lot easier to judge who the best players are in the league at least defensively. So there you have it, a little summary of traditional defensive stats versus more advanced modern day defensive stats. And as always, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, check out my other videos, make it a great day, and thanks again for joining me on the channel, and we'll see you next time.